And do you want me to start recording? It does it automatically. Okay. So now you have people joining us. For those of you guys just joining us, we'll get started in a few minutes. We're just letting everybody roll in. We got about two minutes left. Okay, I guess we're going to get started. Thank you everyone for joining Link's first Zoom conference for 2020. My name is Christina and I'm on Link and I'm the Independent Immobility Specialist. I am here to introduce Lane, who is going to be our speaker today. She's a certified professional in accessibility core competencies. And I'm going to go ahead and let her take it from here. Great, thank you so much and welcome everyone. Appreciate you taking the time out of your day today um, to explore the case for, um, for digital accessibility as part of this storefront to web accessibility series for the, the conference. Um, Nick and I are both pretty excited to be joining you all and to share all of this information. I will apologize in advance. You will periodically um, ha see my video mute as I attempt to blow my nose. Um, the smoke is getting to me like I'm sure many are, are experiencing. And uh, while medication helps, it's not always perfect. So I will apologize in advance for that. And I promise to mute my audio, I do. So you don't have to hear me blow my nose either. Um, if you if you would like to follow along with our PowerPoint, Nick has just put in the text chat a link to Google Drive where you can find a um, copy of the PowerPoint presentation in PowerPoint as well as Google Slides formats. So you can follow along um, in there and there are links in the, the slides um, as we progress, Nick will also be, well, one of us, depending on who's talking, will be tossing those in the chat for you as well. So you can um, check out additional resources as you go. And we also encourage, if you're able um, you know, and have comments or questions, to go ahead and put those in the text chat if you're able or the Q&A. Um, and Christina, do they have the ability to, to raise a hand as well? Yes, they do. Okay. And I will, I will, if there's any questions, I will def definitely let you know and, and ask the questions. All right, fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, as Christina mentioned, I am Lane Amaro. 
I have lived in Boise for coming up on, t t yeah, 12 years now, 12 or 13 years now. Um, I have a master's in assistive technology and human services, as well as a certificate in um, accessibility core competencies. CPAC is the acronym for that, CPACC. Um, in addition, I have 10 years of experience working in vocational rehabilitation and doing assistive technology evaluations for individuals with, who are blind or low vision in their employment situations, in their home, to find assistive technology. And then the five years additional experience doing specifically digital accessibility work. So I've been in the physical environment, I've been in the digital environment, I also bring to the table a unique perspective as an individual who's blind and who uses the very assistive technologies that others with disabilities are going to be using as well to access your digital content. So you will get the opportunity to experience and hear what people who are blind hear when they engage with different content. And hello everyone. Again, just wanted to say thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Nicholas Stallings. I'm with the Idaho Assistive Technology Project. I am a, oh, we already got, oh, we already got messages coming in here. I apologize here from Mr. Ian Bott. Hello, Mr. Bott. I'm glad you made it. Go, go Vandals, don't forget. Yes, I am with the Idaho Assistive Technology Project with the University of Idaho, where we are a grant funded project under the Center on Disabilities and Human Development through the College of Education. I'm a lending library coordinator slash AT specialist. Uh, I have more than 10 years working with people with disabilities in all different capacities. Um, my focus here at the center or at the project is computer access, deaf blindness, and web accessibility. I don't have uh, really, I don't know anything that I'm doing. I just kind of go with the flow, but I'm definitely a jack of all trades and a master of none. And uh, I do what I can here to support Lane and make sure that we are educating, you know, the population about what we can do to, to better support people with disabilities um, on the web, online, and things like that. So thank you again. And if you haven't noticed, both Nick and I are a little bit laid back. <laughs> not real formal. And um, we will be rolling with things today. We may encounter some technical challenges as I have to stop sharing and start sharing and, and that kind of thing as well. So be prepared for probably some silliness. Um, before, so kind of our objective today, as this is a series, we are not going to dig in too deeply into the, the weeds of digital accessibility, but we want to talk about what accessibility is, explore the parallels between the accessibility of storefronts and physical spaces and, as compared to your web front or your digital spaces. We want to identify at least four benefits to digital accessibility and how that can benefit your business or your personal brand if you happen to be an individual who's um, rather than a business or an organization joining us today. And we want to help you identify the first steps towards becoming an accessible company or accessible brand. And Hopefully we'll have time to even get you guys working on your own uh, accessibility statement to kind of keep the momentum going and really start to get that ball rolling and start really taking those steps towards an accessible digital culture for your company. So in short, accessibility is the ability to access that could be your physical or your digital space. And Stephen Krug, who wrote, Don't Make Me Think, a common sense approach to web accessibility, simply says that it is not just the right thing to do, but it is profoundly the right thing to do. Because the one argument for accessibility that doesn't get made nearly often enough is how extraordinarily better it makes some people's lives. So hopefully throughout this week, throughout this series, you will find some tools and strategies to put in your own toolbox to help make other people's lives better. And how awesome is that to be able to do that just as a part of your everyday work? And 
hopefully without a whole lot of extra work. So like I said, accessibility simply is the ability to access. So you're thinking about um, what experience do you want people to have with your information, with your brand, with your store? And does the environment, whether that's physical or digital, um, does the environment allow for everyone to have that experience that you want them to have? The image here of a flight of stairs next to an escalator is an example that we might be accustomed to seeing in the physical space. And we all know the, ex the experience is very different between climbing stairs and hopping on an escalator. Um, and it all depends on the flight of stairs as well. I'm thinking of the Boise Town Square Mall at the moment, and I'll take the escalator any day than those stairs in the center where I always inevitably end up on the inside of the spiral and can't keep my whole foot on the step or yeah, it turns into a bit of a mess, but you gotta think about the experience that you want people to have. Um, and do you want it to be, you know, more of a um, physical exertion and, really active engagement or something a little bit more passive as well. So as we we move through all of this, be thinking about your, your environment and the experience that you want customers to have in the physical environment, the digital environment, with your brand, with your information. When we talk about storefront accessibility, this is your customer's ability to ac access the physical space. It's all about that physically navigating the space. Can people walk through the front door? Can people um, walk around the store without encountering significant obstacles? Can people use signage to find what they'd like? The US Access Board has created, and Nick, if you could toss this link in, thank you, toss a neat link in initially. The US Access Board has created some standards and guidelines for Title III, so um, of the ADA, um, so public accommodations and what businesses need to do in order to make their physical spaces as accessible. The link that Nick tossed in there in the text chat is a, a tremendous um, asset to, to any architecture, ar sorry, uh, architect who is building a new space, but it is also valuable for store owners and managers who are setting up displays and that sort of thing to be looking at and considering if I put this really gorgeous display smack in the middle of the aisle, are people with wheelchairs going to be able to get around the side, either side of it? Um, or <laughs> I, I, as an individual who's blind, I cannot tell you how many times um, I've gone into a business and the display has been glass shelves on metal wiring or it's included a mirror and my cane finds it, my shoulder finds it because it's, I'm just not expecting anything in the middle of the walkway. So these guidelines can, can help with that. And it's not just about the architects, it's also about those of you who are creating that in-store experience. So just to kind of drive home this experience, we figured give you some examples of, you know, um, things that someone with a disability would come across in our physical spaces, but thinking about how those can apply to our uh, electronic spaces. So, I mean, what do you, here we have an example. We have a sign uh, that basically says wheelchair access around the back of building. And we have another picture, an example of a tennis court with an accessible ramp. Um, two very simple things, right? Two, uh, granted they're providing uh, some support for an individual with a disability, but what's the experience going to be like? What exactly are you getting them? Um, Lane, if you want to hit the next one. So we talk about ramps. Uh, another thing we talk about are doors, right? On the left here, we have, I don't know, those, those circle hand uh, door knobs. Those are really tough to, to navigate and for people to, to use, especially, I don't, I mean, I know myself when I'm carrying things um, it, it compared to the picture on the right, which is an accessible door handle, accessible lock as well. Um, that little lock can slide both ways. So that experience, it comes down to what you actually 
want your the individual to experience. Lane, I think we have one more after this. Right? Yep. And when we think about doors and ramps, you're also thinking, can they even get through the front door? Can everyone get through your front door? Um, that is really important to, to consider. Perfect. Another good example of when you're talking about signs, right? On the left, we have a welcome sign with Braille that was actually printed. And, you know, it was printed in Braille. I'm sure the intentions were great, but if it's not embossed, someone who is blind or low vision isn't going to be able to access that sign, right? And so you can kind of look to the right as a, this one actually has two examples, two bad examples as well, but the difference between high contrast and high visibility versus low contrast and vibration and colors and things like that. So it's, it's important to take all of that into consideration when you're designing these spaces and making sure that you're providing you know opportunity for everyone across the board and people then wonder well how does this translate into my web space because the physical environment there are things that you've put in place to accommodate assistive technology users wheelchair ramps for people who are using walkers scooters wheelchairs um, I talked about making enough space for people to get around displays with that assistive technology. You're, you're making accommodations in the physical environment. And a lot of people know that individuals with disabilities are going, probably going to be using some sort of assistive technology tool um, to access their digital environment. So individuals who are blind or low vision, for example, might use magnifiers or I'm using a screen reader and you'll get to see a brief demonstration of that here in just a moment. But you, you may not be thinking that the reader on the other end of your web page, your blog, your social media posts, um, if you're, your brand you know, is a personal brand, you may not be thinking that about the user on the other end who might be using an assistive technology. In the digital environment, you, it's all about text. Um, it's about being able to see and hear the information that's on the screen. And for most people, you've probably figured out that our digital environment is pretty, pretty visual. Um, you're not going to be able to reach through your screen and feel the, the letters on my screen. Um, you know, if we were doing cooking, um, you wouldn't be able to, to smell what I was cooking. So it's all about the senses of seeing and hearing. Um, as I mentioned, well, the U.S. Access Board is another tremendous resource for um, guidelines on how to make those digital environments more accessible. But the biggest thing is having text alternatives for anything you can see or hear. And it's super important to remember that looks can be deceiving. And this is where we might run into our first technical glitch. I'm going to have to stop sharing and restart in just a moment so that you can hear the screen reader as well. Okay. Started screen share. Mute. Currently. All right. So you heard Tom pop in there. My, my extra voice said I was screen sharing, um, informed me that you can see my screen again, and let me know that I was unmuted, thankfully. Task switching. Power For slide. For those of you who are able to see this slide, you're able to see the text white on black on the left that says looks can be deceiving. And you can also see on the right hand side more text. Google I'm going to show you guys what my screen reader tells me is on this slide, though. Heading level one looks are deceiving. Heading level one looks are deceiving. That's all it tells me is heading level one looks are deceiving. It, does, it only reads that white text on a black background. This is because the text on the right is an image. Slide 13 dash dash. So advanced to slide 13 here as my screen reader just announced for you. And I will go through the same 
slide, but with the text alternative for the image included. The issue with web accessibility is the fact that blind and visually dash impaired people need the single biggest boost to achieve equivalence since the real dash world image. Web is a visual medium. Joe Clark image. So it let me, it read the text and it told me it was also an image. Heading level one looks are deceiving. And then it reads the text on the left. And why it's doing it backwards, I'm not really sure. But this is just one example of how looks can be deceiving. Um, if you did not know that that was an image, you would not know that people who could not see it could not access it without that text alternative. In this case, it's specifically called alt text. Um, and as we will learn on Wednesday with the intro to accessible visuals, there is a difference between a text alternative and alternative text or alt text. There are other places where text alternatives can be very helpful as well. And we're gonna, I'm gonna, so I've gotta stop sharing again. Meeting control. And, uh, Here's and All right, we are gonna bear with me here. The screen reader is probably going to started screen share. You are muted. V3 final edit dot PowerPoint meeting controls on Un mute currently. Mute current mute currently on. All right, I accidentally muted myself there. PowerPoint slide show V3 final edit so, dot P city lights survey left bracket. Welcome to city lights left bracket and accessible home page right bracket dash. I've, the World Wide Web Consortium um, is the home of the web content accessibility guidelines. And these are the foundation for the guidelines presented by the US Access Board for Digital Accessibility. They have this website to see kind of before and after. So this homepage for City of Lights, there's some short news stories. Um, I think one of them is what uh, shortage of brains hinders research or something along those lines. And these stories can be viewed, you know, you can visually scan the page and see the different text that separates the different pieces of information. Visually, the, this text is, is being organized in a way that um, you can quickly find what you need. For someone who's a screen reader user, we would be looking for headings, because that's what that color and font changes tell you as a visual reader, that this is a, a, like a heading or a headline for a story. So we would look for headings. On this page, however, you'll find that there's only one. Wrapping to top. Inaccessible home page before and after demonstration heading level one. Wrapping to top. Inaccessible. This is my only heading. So without being able to quickly jump among those headings, I can't skim read and pick which of those stories that I want to read. Task switching. Meeting control. PowerPoint slot. V3 file. City lights survey X. Welcome to city lights. Accessible home page. Here's the accessible version of that home page where there are more headings. Elsewhere on the web heading level two, City Lights Concert heading level two. So now I'm down at the City Lights Concert heading, so I could read about that now. Three penguins playing on stage graphic. And there's alt text there, three penguins playing on stage graphic. It read that alt text to me. Free penguin slogan at zoo benefit concert causes confusion among city rockers. Adjective or verb? I know that was a very confusing example, but that is one example of what's similar to having an accessible sign in your physical environment. Those headings are critical for finding what you need to on the web page, just like your accessible signs are critical to finding what you need in your physical environment. Similar, similarly, task meeting can power V3 final edit P city lights survey accessible survey. Welcome to city, welcome to city, welcome to city lights. Meeting can power V3 city lights survey. I apologize um, for all the extra speech there, but I apparently don't have the inaccessible survey up. So I'll show you how here though. Um, Retype email, edit, name, edit, virtual piece, city. When there is a form, there are not always text labels. 
Explore site by top go button. None radio button and not. So this first one, the city light serve a box that says to the left of the word none. Visually, there is a label, but sometimes these forms don't have the text label in the background, and that is also important so that the individual knows what they're they're going to be typing. And again, we'll dig more into that when we um, get into introduction to welcome, accessible visuals. Welcome to meeting controls. I'm going to turn things over to, to Nick um, here as I kind of clean up on my side. You're All right, you guys see my PowerPoint here? All right, good to go. Okay, so we're just going to talk a little bit about the benefits um, of digital accessibility and when we're talking about your website. And of course, um, the best place to start with the benefits is that uh, you're complying with the law, right? This is what we talk a lot about is when it comes to what the law says and um, how we're going to relate that to our day-to-day -day operations. So the first things we'd like to talk about just to, as a reminder was of course the ADA. We're at 30 years today or this year. Um, and as a reminder, came out in 1990 and prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life, including jobs, schools, transportation, and all public and private places that are open to the general public. So you can kind of assume and kind of see where that's going to lead into we will talk about it a little bit, but lead into websites and accessibility on your websites. Um, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act, as, as well as the reauthorization, I believe, of 1998, the Workforce Investment Act. Um, it just requires all federal agencies to develop, procure, maintain, and use information and communications technology, ICT, we've talked about that a little bit, um, that is accept accessible to people with disabilities, regardless of whether or not they work at the federal government. So this was an, an opportunity to say that everything needs to be accessible if the federal government's going to be involved. And then section 255 of the Telecommunications Act, I believe is 1997 off the top of my head, um, requires all telecommunication products and services to be accessible to people with disabilities. And this is required to the extent access is readily achievable, meaning easily accomplishable and without much difficulty. Now, if you have uh, any experience with um, working with accessibility, you know that it's uh, that part about uh, readily achievable can be debated, but things are getting better and that's where you have people like myself and Lane who are self-proclaimed, although Lane has definitely proven this, um, professionals in, in this area. We can help you make these things accessible. It does take some time to practice, but once you get the hang of it, you know, we, we understand how, how difficult it is, but really uh, the big thing we're talking about here is the legal risk and the subsequent laws that go along with that. And as an example, we figured we would talk a little bit about a case study, um, that being Win dixie um, This was uh, brought to court uh, where blind customers were unable to access information on the website. So we were talking about things like the store locator, the coupons that the store had available on the website, store events, any specials that they were only showing on the website. Um, Win dixie uh, had tr requested that the a requested a dismissal the a website is not a public accommodation is not a public space but unfortunately the courts uh, uh fortunately for, you know, the courts did rule against that um they did find that there is a link between the store and the site and thus the, the site the website is covered as in a public accommodation um one of the things the site must be made accessible is what they ended up doing. Um, one of the things they brought down was having a, an inaccessible website violates Title III of the American with, with Disabilities Act, and as well as a business is required to make its website accessible, relying on the WC3C World Web, Web Content World Wide Web Consortium. I'm sorry, guidelines, also known as the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. I believe. Nick, there we do have a question. Okay, yeah. I'll um, go ahead and take a break. Is, how about accessibility to meetings by Zoom meetings? That is setting up Zoom meetings, Idaho Human Rights Commission or DOJ complaint. How about accessibility? Mm -hmm. So what yeah, so Eric, there's I, I think I see where you're 
coming here. Um, so where we get into it, and Lane can help me out here, is that Zoom actually has all of these abilities. Whether we were talking about um, closed captioning or we're talking about an opportunity to bring in a, an interpreter for those who might be deaf or hard of hearing, um, Zoom provides those things. Then it's up to the individual or the agency to be implementing those things. And this is where we can kind of help guide those deals and kind of support that um, is making sure that things are going to be, um, you know, correct by the law standards. Now, as far as setting up complaints and things like that, I believe that would go through, Lane, you have the Department of Justice. That's yeah, what I um, the Human Rights Commission focus has not been on digital accessibility. And if complaints have been getting sent to the Idaho Human Rights Commission, um, they get kicked back to the complainant to be sent to the DOJ, Department of Justice. Um, I do know that Disability Rights Idaho has also supported some um, some of the accessibility complaints as well, uh, particularly as it relates to voting because of the, their grant funding. But Disability Rights Idaho is another place to go when it comes to a point of actually as an individual filing a complaint. So Eric, I'll give you a second if you wanted to add anything to that. Hopefully it answers your question there. Make sure we're not missing anyone else. Okay. All right, so continuing on with the Winn-Dixie case, uh, court, the um, court ended up requiring that Winn-Dixie adopt and post an explicit accessibility policy. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this later today um, to ensure the persons without di with disabilities have full and equal enjoyment of its website and shall accompany the public policy statement with an accessible means of submitting accessibility questions and problems. So basically they said, we're going to open up to the public and make sure that we're available for those conversations, um, that we're going to have our accessibility policy online as well. Um, another thing they were required to do is conduct annual accessibility trainings for IT and web staff so that they can learn to create and maintain content that meets that YCAG criteria, web content accessibility guidelines. Um, and the, the third thing, and it's interesting with the implications, is that uh, to make sure that any third-party applications or content posted to the Winn-Dixie site must also meet YCAG requirements. So not only did it say that the website had to meet this, but that anyone that they're linking to needs to be able to meet this as well. And so it was it's an opportunity to say, yes, we are going to take accessibility seriously, of course, saying, and that it is a public space. It is, it should be, it is accessible to the public and should be accessible to everyone in the public. And I think here, so Lane, would you like me to stop the share and let you take back over here? Um, yep, we can, we can do that. And I'll just add as, as Nick stopped sharing there, I will add that the Winn-Dixie was the kind of a landmark case with the, the Department of Justice. Um, it was it was the first case that was taken to the Department of Justice and that was heard in court and it has been upheld I can't remember what, when that was but it was it was at least 10 years ago now and um, I want to make sure you guys don't hear my screen reader when I come back on screen share <laughs> It's, I know this screen reader is overwhelming, but uh, the Winn-Dixie case was, was the first. And just last year in 2019, it was upheld with the same rulings through um, when a blind consumer filed a complaint against Domino's Pizza as well. And it extended the coverage, not to just their website, but their apps for iPhone, iPad as well there was a, a pizza deal that was available only if you ordered through the Domino's app on your phone. And that was, that was the sticking point. He, he couldn't get that deal if he called into the store or ordered on the website. It could only be um, granted if he was using the app and the app was not accessible. So even it's as near as last year in 2019, Department of Justice continued to uphold this ruling. So even though the Americans with Disabilities Act does not explicitly say that websites and applications are considered public accommodations, Department of Justice rulings continually uphold that they do fall under public accommodation. 
um, even if there's not a physical store. Netflix um, is another great example of this. And there was a lawsuit against Netflix as well because Netflix does not have a physical location. It is a web-based um, service only. And the Department of Justice ruled in that case as well that those digital assets were covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So as you consider whether or not digital accessibility is a benefit to you in mitigating legal risk, definitely take into consideration which of those civil laws might apply to your personal brand, your organization as a nonprofit or um, a small business. We try not to spend a whole lot of time on legal risk because neither of us are lawyers. Don't want to be either. I'm not going back to school. So, so I like to focus on some of these other benefits. They, they are a little bit more tangible and they are a lot less scary. So one of the other benefits is protecting and enhancing your brand. Social responsibility is a very, very common term in our world right now. And social, socially responsible companies have a tendency to attract and retain customers willing to pay a premium. Um, so this might include you know, individuals, customers without disabilities, who they're willing to pay a premium for your products and services if they know that you are inclusive or that a part of their purchase is going to support your um, efforts to include everyone. I saw a study recently, and I didn't include it here, said that millennials in particular, when they start looking for careers and applying for jobs as well, social responsibility is something that they value in a potential employer. And inclusion of people with disabilities is included in that. Um, along those lines, social responsible companies also empower employees to do good. They're going to encourage their employees to, to volunteer, to donate time, et cetera, which in turn fosters employee morale and productivity. Um, Barclays is, is a pretty good example of how their brand was enhanced and even improved upon once they made a commitment to digital accessibility. In their efforts, they found that once disabled, com disabled customers found that their products and services were accessible, they were very reluctant to switch to any Barclays competitors because they were fearful of losing access. Um, they, making products accessible also drew um, employees who, with disabilities to apply for jobs with their company. This in turn has the effect of increasing the accessibility of your customer facing products because if you find that your um, employee portals are not accessible and you make efforts to make those more accessible, that translates to your customers as well. And this, this is what Barclays figured out and they, they have a very loyal customer base now. And along those lines, you can increase market share with an accessible physical or digital space even. It's important to consider that you could be missing out on um, oh gosh, what does it say here? Two, $200 billion annually. Um, the, the market of individuals with disabilities and their families has um, discretionary funding of $200 billion in the US or $7 trillion if you're, you happen to have the ability to, to tap that worldwide market. That's, that's very, very huge. <laughs> and further examples, um, in 2011, the FCC regulatory changes prompted NPR to provide 
transcripts of all of their archived recordings. This increased traffic to their website by almost 7%. That's a pretty significant impact. And that was all driven by the fact that their audio is also now available in text. So when people do a Google search, their archived content is more likely to pop up. So some in the audience, audience might be familiar with the term search engine optimization. Um, having text examples um, or text alternatives to anything you can see or hear that is not already text can drive traffic to your digital assets. And in a 2019 study by Accenture, um, it was found that companies with an inclusive working environment, so for an environment that was inclusive to p employees with disabilities, over the span of three years, 2015 to 2018, these companies had a 20% higher revenue, 30% greater profit margins, and twice the net incomes of comparable um, businesses. So that's a pretty significant financial benefit as well, just by having an environment that is accessible to employees with disabilities. In the last two topics, when we've talked about the benefits uh, of social responsibility and you know, improving branding, uh, as well as increasing your market share, you've probably noticed that there was a hint of this in, empowers innovation. And yes, in, it does. Um, having accessible content in digital assets prepares a company to um, be robust and to be able to adapt with the ever-changing digital environment. Who would have thought a year ago we'd be sitting here on Zoom um, to, to do this conference, right? So our digital space is constantly changing. And if you've been on Facebook lately, you're probably thinking, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But they're constantly improving that digital environment for us. Um, accessible design is by nature flexible, making, you know, resulting in interactions that are more human, human-centered, natural, and contextual. So it's making sure that not just people with disabilities have access, but it improves the experience, that user experience for everyone. Um, just as an example from Google, um, their work to make images accessible using artificial intelligence is driving innovation in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence, as is their work to um, auto caption. We don't want to put people like Rhonda out of a job. We, we appreciate her very much. And right now, auto captioning is not nearly as good as she is, I promise. Um, but the efforts in making auto captioning better is improving machine learning. And this is having benefits across the board. Many companies have automated a lot of different processes, including even accepting payments because of the efforts in auto captioning and artificial intelligence AI, which were initially created to give people with disabilities greater access. The same is true with things like autocomplete and voice control or speech to text. Things that Google innovated specifically for people with disabilities that have now been adopted by probably all of us. I, I don't know very many people who don't take advantage of autocomplete and the dictation feature, particularly on their mobile phones. And uh, one of the leaders at Google says that the accessibility problems are the mainstream breakthroughs of tomorrow. And that is very true with some of the, the innovations that I mentioned from Google specifically. I want to take a moment. Well, 
I've got, I've got two reasons to take a moment. I need a drink of water, but I also want to give you guys a chance to ask any questions about those benefits as well. All right, I have not heard any questions come in. Nick, did you have anything you wanted to add to the discussion of benefits before we move on to actually taking some steps towards accessing those benefits? Um, no, I think you hit it all. I, I, I mean, I guess going back to our examples of doors and ramps and things like that, I mean, how often do we use the automatic door buttons now, right? Especially, like I mentioned, carrying things and things like that. Is accessibility really does have implications further than just making sure someone can access it, that one person, right? And actually, accessibility does apply to all of us in some way. It all helps us in some way, so even if that audio, audio, audible pedestrian signal does make you jump and want to run across the street when it starts beeping at you, it's, it's still um, been helpful to a lot more people than just the blind people that it was, it was installed for. So there's, and I don't know that we even think about the ramps and the automatic um, motion censored door options either. And many of those types of benefits um, that are designed for people with disabilities in the physical space. So we have a comment. It says universal design for all definitely applies to all digital world too. Great examples and thank you. Yes, very, very, very true. I was just about to bring up universal design. That's, Great to know that we have other people on that, that same um, kind of wavelength. It, it is very important in our physical and our digital spaces. A lot of people then though get overwhelmed. What, is, what are my first steps? How do I start? I, I want to make my company, my brand, my information accessible in my digital spaces as well. How do I do that? And there's a lot of strategy that goes into it. Um, and sometimes it does feel like playing Jenga. This is why I've included the image of someone um, trying to pull a Jenga piece out of a Jenga puzzle, because sometimes you get going and you're like, wait, if I do this, it's going to cause all these other things to fall apart. So there's a lot of strategy that will go into um, moving forward with digital accessibility. Your very first steps will include creating accessibility policies and or statements, um, assigning different responsibilities to different people within the organization for accomplishing anything outlined in the policy. Of course, anytime you're assigning a responsibility, you're also thinking about who's going to pay for that. So checking out, you know, checking your existing budget and resources. You might have an IT professional on your staff who's already familiar with YCAG, the WCAG or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. So evaluate your existing resources. Review the environment. Do an evaluation of your current digital assets and find out how accessible they already are. You may have been doing it and not even known it. And that includes reviewing your websites as well as documents and anything you post on social media. And then establish a monitoring framework um, and quality assurance, which can include engaging stakeholders. Um, finding people with disabilities to test out this different stuff or to give you feedback. And um, at that point, I would also encourage you to consider um, compensation for individuals who are, are helping out. Um, this has become kind of a big thing in the community of people with disabilities as of late. They, I've seen it pop up on my social media, among my networks, as an individual with a disability who does a lot of this kind of accessibility testing. Um, there are, there are 
entities taking advantage of, of people with disabilities and um, saying, well, test this for me for free because I have no budget and then actually not listen. And I think where they get upset is that people aren't always listening when they give their feedback, nothing ever changes either. So um, taking into consideration, not only what you want that end experience to be for your customers, but what experience you want your testers to have as well and engaging them in a meaningful way in that process, not just for them, but also for your content developers. Um, the more I do this, the more time I spend with web developers, app developers, and we, we develop some pretty strong friendships because there is a mutual respect for um, our given areas of expertise. So once you get to that point, definitely keeping in mind that the individuals with disabilities you engage in that testing and evaluation framework, um, you know, they, this is a very um, extensive area of expertise, just like an app developer would be as well. So let's take a look at that first step, creating a policy and or accessibility statement. When we think about an accessibility policy, you get, think about your scope, right? How much of this do you want it to cover? Um, do you need to take baby steps? Most of us do. <laughs> Try to keep your policy simple. You can reference the standards and guidelines that you want to achieve. Web content accessibility, YCAG, Version two um, level A is generally accepted as the standard at this point. That is what the ADA points to. That is what the US Access Board guidelines are founded on, though they go beyond um, the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C guidelines. That's, that's what they are based upon. So that is usually a good starting point. But you, decide for yourself because your experience, you may want it to be um, a bit more than just the industry standard. And that's what we mean by defined conformance levels. Level um, version two, level A, AA or triple A. Triple A um, is quite a bit more extensive than double A, but it also provides a, a bit more of an experience for the assistive technology user as well. Set your scope. Do you want it to apply to every aspect of your business for your employees, for your customers, for your documents, for your website, for your social media? Do you want it to apply only to internal documentation and software? Do you want it to, where, what, how broad do you want this to be? And make sure that you consider procurement as a part of this. Nick mentioned in the Winn-Dixie case study that the courts ruled that any third party um, applications or content on the Winn-Dixie website had to also be accessible. By third party, that means anything that they purchased. So um, Winn-Dixie and a huge part of the, the Winn-Dixie case was surrounding the, the chat feature on the website. They had paid a third party company to create the chat experience and it was not accessible. So consider purchasing in the policy as well. Um, and then in that policy, you can also include the establishing and monitoring or quality assurance processes. If you wanted to, um, it can be as simple or as complex as you would like it to and as it would apply to your particular situation, your ind individual brand, personal brands, nonprofit, that sort of thing. Public statements are a great way to go um, in addition to the policy because it announces to your customers and to your potential employees your commitment to social responsibility. If that is something that is of value to you and your organization. So you can include um, your commitment to accessibility um, and you can include some of the basic policy things as well. So you can reference the standards and the conformance um, standards that we talked about, the conformance level. So in your policy, you could, could some, you know, you could 
state in plain language that um, you have an inclusive business culture or um, are socially responsible, whatever, however you want to phrase that, and then include the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0 AA or whichever guidelines and conformance level you choose to um, pursue in the policy. It is also important to include contact information. So having a contact person setting that responsibility in the policy of who individuals can contact when they're having challenges. And that could be a form on the website or that could be an email or a phone number. Um, just making sure that whatever option that is, is also going to be accessible. So considering a phone number, um, would that be accessible to individuals who are unable to speak or hear? Um, you might want to select a, a potentially different option or provide both. If you've reached the point of doing an evaluation of your digital assets, it can also be valuable to include a list of your known limitations and things that you're trying to address. That way, um, you know, it further demonstrates to the individuals with disabilities that you're, you're actively working on it. And it could also prevent duplication of complaints or um, you know, comments and suggestions for improvement. If your website has or um, documents have to be viewed in a specific program, if your website is known to work best with Google Chrome, it's important to also include those details on an accessibility statement so that people with disabilities know that, oh, you know, I'm using Firefox to access this website and they say it works best with Chrome. I should give that a shot before I call to complain kind of thing. And of course, it's always um, optional, but you could include links in information about the federal civil laws that are applicable to your organization as well, and even provide um, your customers with the information on how to file complaints there if they chose to. Some companies do that, some do not. So all up to the individuals making those decisions. So we may not get to the point of actually practicing anything. We are coming up on two o'clock pretty quickly. But be sure that you're using plain language principles. The web content um, saying when you're referencing something that is a limitation um, and you know that the videos on your website do not have closed captioning you could say it, we know, you know, you could say it along the lines of videos on our site do not have captions, or you could say WCAG criteria 1.2.2 has not been met on our website. I think people are going to be a little bit more apt to understand that, yeah, we know our videos don't have captions than they would um, understanding that web criteria 1.2.2 was not met. So use that plain language when you're um, writing your accessibility statements. Keep it, keep that language simple. Other plain language principles to consider, use short sentences, use active voice, so type like you talk, and be conversational and approachable. Um, if you want feedback, you gotta be approachable. So, um, a sample accessibility statement from um, City Lights Incorporated is committed to ensuring digital accessibility for people with disabilities. We are continually improving the user experience for everyone. And then it goes on to reference the specific web content accessibility guidelines and standards. There's a, a separate section for what level they'll be conforming to. 
so web content accessibility guidelines WCAG, WCAG um, requirements for designers and it goes on to explain that as well um, and then it goes on to say that we know our website's only partially conformant and it lists and then it provides the options for feedback in this case um, I don't think it shows on the text but it shows contact information they chose to use email rather than phone in their example Idaho state government web accessibility statement is also pretty simple. Idaho.gov wishes to ensure accessibility of web resources for all users and has been developed for a wide variety of browsers and assistive technologies. So there they've, they've stated their commitment and they've told you their technical requirements. Um, goes on to talk about how the, the Idaho web portal has been designed to meet web publishing guidelines, but does admit that sites links to sites outside of the portal may not be accessible. So it includes those limitations and is very conversational. I know we're coming up very quickly on two o'clock. This does kind of wrap up what we we had um, for for you guys today the rest of the week we will dive a little bit deeper into understanding disabled users a little bit more we've gotten a little bit of a taste of what it's like for someone who's blind but we'll dig in a little bit more to that on that tomorrow and then um, we'll talk about accessible visuals and accessible audio in the last two days so do we have any questions for myself or for Nick. That was really awesome. Thank you very much. I mean, like, I don't want to stop anyone from asking questions, but that was really fantastic. That's a discussion too, I felt like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We have a few um, comments. Excellent job, everyone. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'd can... like to take the time right now to thank Nick and Lane. And um, if and we all want to make sure when you guys stay on and get, we do have a survey at the end, give us some feedback. Um, looks like Nick and Lane put on their contact information. So if you have any questions, please reach out to them. They've been great giving us a little bit of insight of what they do. They are fantastic. Thank you guys. Thank you for the, the opportunity. And again, I'm happy to stick around a little bit for questions if needed as well. Yeah, I just, I'll just add the, you know, thank you guys for attending. We're happy to, to be here to help. Um, and in the future, these next three days we have, we will get in a little bit more in depth when it comes to plain language, when it comes to what things assistive to someone with a disability is using in terms of assistive technology. Uh, we'll talk about that framework, how you go about creating accessible content, um, things like that. We, we definitely want to give you something to use and we're here to help if you have any questions. So don't hesitate to reach out. So there was a comment from James that says, great information. I would have to agree. Um, Nick, could you toss our emails into text chat for people too? Yeah, for those who are. might not be Go able ahead. to access, might not be able to see the slide, but can access text chat. Go ahead and do it again, yeah. just in case. Um, and I don't know if we had any late comers as well, but, um, and I'm sure Lana and Christina will make the um, Google Drive link to the PowerPoint and Google Slides available as well. So if you feel like we went through some of this information pretty quick, um, you're welcome to go back and take a look at those as well. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye, everybody.
Take care, y'all. Thank you.